God, as we come to you now, Father, let's pray that we will humble our hearts, and Father, that we will truly seek your will in our lives, Father. We're coming in agreement with each and every thing that's voiced at this great pulpit moments earlier, Father. Our faithful brother and your faithful servant, Father, we come in agreement with that, just asking that your Holy Spirit would have its will today in our hearts and our lives. Father, that we would put the distractions of this world aside. Father, that we would enjoy fellowship corporately and individually with you. Because you are a mighty God, Father, and that's what you demand. That we give our whole heart to you. Father, I pray today that we would no longer stand at the door and look through the crack that is there, held by the world, but that we would throw the door open and allow you to come through. Father, and truly minister to our hearts this day. Father, we truly come to you today asking that your will be done in the life of this church. Father, it's evident through everything that we see as we walk through this world and see you at work around us by the very testimony that was given earlier this day of an individual Father chose to follow your path and your will in your life. And Father, you gave a powerful, a powerful ministry started in this family. Father, we pray that you continue to work in that. Father, we pray that, that you would hear our humble hearts today, Father, man. Your Holy Spirit would do a mighty work in this place. Father, we're so thankful for this place, Father, for the place that you give us to come and, and join together on Sundays and Wednesday nights, Father, but where we come and lift up our praise and worship to you each and every day of the week, Father, and all the activities that you involve us in. I pray, Father, that the heart that would come here would come to seek you and seek your will. Father, once again, we're thankful for this place that you give us. Father, we're thankful for your watch care over us. We continue to ask that you work in all the lives of those that was mentioned earlier, Father, those in military service, those that are, are hurting, those who just need a touch from you. Father, I pray that as you touch our hearts and bring those names to us, that we will be obedient servants and that we would extend that touch of love that you would have us extend. Father, be now with Brother David as he comes and gives us your word. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit would lead him and guide him Father, in such a way that our hearts would be broken for the sin in our life. And that we would answer the call that you extend to that to us. Father, we lift all this up in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <coughs> All right, boys and girls. Ready? <coughs> You're gonna be shy today. So, yeah. Here they go. <laughs> we have been preaching through the Gospel of Luke and talking about the amazing things that Jesus has done. And as we uh, look at our passages today, we're going to be seeing the world like Jesus. A, a radical shift in priority is what we're talking about when we see the world like Jesus does. And so um, when you think about the last few decades, the 1990s were known as the decade of greed. In fact, greed was good uh, in the 90s. That was a saying back then. Uh, it was uh, capitalism gone wild. And there was no consideration for integrity during the time. There was just the consideration for how much wealth someone could accumulate. And as a nation, uh, we ultimately are suffering the consequences of all of the wrong choices that we make. And so today, as we look at Luke chapter 12, Beginning in verse 13, we're going to get to look into a household crisis. Luke chapter 12, verse 13. And so someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. Well, now, if the brother was the older of the two, did he have to share the inheritance? No, he didn't. That was Jewish law. He didn't really have to. Uh, but Jesus is uh, in this situation, he responds. But he said to him, and notice there are two words on that screen that are in red. So he says to one who addresses him, man who appointed me 
a judge or arbitrator over you. Now, I don't know if you find that just absolutely hilarious, but Jesus says, who appointed me as a judge or an arbitrator over you? I mean, this is God in the flesh. But as he has this response to him, notice that he says, okay, you're asking me to, to judge in this, and this is not really, you know, something that is like a big concern for me. But notice then he says to them. I want you to notice that. Because this is not just Jesus addressing an issue with one person, but also with the brother. Beware. Anytime you see a sign like that on a gate, you're out going to somebody's house and there's a sign, beware, you're expecting a big, bad, mean dog. You don't want to be bitten. You don't want, you know, whatever the case might be. And here is Jesus saying, here is something that you really need to watch out for. Beware. Be on your guard against every form of greed. Today, in uh, some of our adult Bible study groups, we were studying a lesson on being filled with the Holy Spirit and how many of these things that we include in our Christian life uh, cause us to leak. If we were filled with the Spirit, these sins that we are including cause us to leak. And so Jesus is saying, look, here is one of the things for a person who is my disciple that will cause them not to be walking fully in the blessed fullness of the Spirit, and that is greed. So as he talks about this, he says, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of possession. Now, I remember everybody says, uh, mostly guys, I suppose, whoever dies with the most toys wins. But we know that that's not actually how that works out because whoever dies with the most toys is gone, and we divide the toys between us, right? So all the jet skis and all the honey stuff and whatever, it's going to somebody. You don't keep the toys. It's not the possessions that are going to matter when life is over. Abundance does not consist of possessions. Now Jesus is going to talk, about it, talk to us about not being greedy, and so he's going to give us a parable. And if you're looking at your word in verse 16, uh, you're going to see this parable. The land of a rich man was very productive. Is there anything wrong with that? No. And he began reasoning to himself saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Is there anything wrong with that? No. I mean, you don't want them to just rot in the field, do you? So he's got to answer this situation. Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all of my grain and my goods. Now, was that the only resolution that he could have had for an overabundance of produce? In fact, as a Jewish person, he would have been being encouraged constantly as he was studying the law to provide for the needs of the poor. And so he had that opportunity to do that. Well, notice that he goes a little further and not only tells us what his external plan is going to be as he perceives his situation and his worldview says, I've got more than I can possibly use, so I need bigger storage spaces. And all of a sudden I'm going, yeah, that means I've got a house full and now I have a storage building and a shop and a garage and I'm and it keeps getting bigger and bigger. You know, do I need all this stuff? Are all of these things, these possessions, what life is about? And so we get to look inside of his soul in verse 19. I will say to my soul, soul, that's interesting. You have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. By the way, you'll see a lot of Christian uh, um, Christmas decorations. Uh, that have that phrase on this year, eat, drink, and be merry. Not this passage, but another passage says that it goes on, God says, well, that eventually will come up here. Uh, eat, drink, and be merry, for you'll die, you're about to die. You know? <coughs> to eat, drink, and be merry, and to just focus on that, is taking our eyes off of eternity. 
God said to him, you fool. Is that something that, you know, we like to hear? That we're making foolish choices? But that's what God said. This very night, your soul be required of you. Now, who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasures for himself, comma, and is not rich toward God. Okay, is there a problem with storing up treasure to a degree? The Bible doesn't have a problem with that at all. What it does have a problem is, is that we're storing up treasures far beyond anything we could possibly ever use while not recognizing the needs around us or being concerned about the spiritual matters, the eternal matters, the things that matter to God. That's the very circumstances we often find ourselves in. in verse 22, Jesus is then going to explain this further. He says to his disciples, for this reason I say to you, do not worry about your life as to what you will eat, nor your body as to what you will put on. For life is more than food, the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. I know some of y'all may be thinking about them, but I don't think they're going to make the playoffs, so just let that go. <laughs> they have no storeroom nor barn, yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than birds? And so as you look at this passage... Uh, you can get a possibly a, a thought that, you know, what is Jesus saying about life? Do not worry about your life. As to what you will eat in your body, what you'll put on. I think what that means is, I'm not going to go to work anymore. Because God is just going to provide. He knows I need food and He knows I need clothes. And so, by the way, uh, honey, I'm not going to the grocery store anymore. Uh, I'm not going to worry about that stuff. Uh, what I'm going to eat. Uh, certainly, you know, God is just going to show up with, I don't know, Domino's Pizza tonight or something. It's just going to arrive. And yet we would say, no, that's foolish. To say that God would not expect us to work. But what is he saying? Do not worry about it. So, how much time do we spend worrying about things that may never come to pass, having all kinds of uh, concerns about things that uh, certainly may uh, be issues for some people in the world, but not really too much of an issue in the United States of America, where there are, though no, there's hundreds, many resources many places to go to provide help. But Jesus is not speaking to people in the United States of America alone when he says this. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. The point is not to worry. Well, if I'm not going to worry, preacher, give me something to do. Well, what should we do? If we're not going to worry, uh, then we're going to pray. And we're going to follow the will of God and the leading of the Holy Spirit in our life. So Jesus says, uh, the ravens, they don't plant, they don't reap, they don't have storerooms or barns. God feeds them, are you more valuable than birds? If Jesus is not saying that we shouldn't work, then what is he saying with all of these passages? This is important for us to understand. So as you look at that, 